Hello doctors, this is Dr. Hela Salman. Very good evening to all of you. So today we are going to start this oncology from MTB step 2 CK 5th edition. So starting with the breast cancer. First of all presentation, breast cancer is found in asymptomatic women on screening mammography or by the palpation of mass by the patient or a physician. So on general screening of uh, by doing this mammography, we, uh, we can uh, easily rule out an asymptomatic women or by the palpation of a mass by the patient or physician. When breast cancer present as a palpable mass, it is hard to the touch. It may also be associated with the retraction of the nipple because ligaments in the breast will withdraw and pull the nipple inward. So it may also be, it's not always associated with the retraction, but we can see the retraction of the nipple because ligaments in the breast will withdraw and pull the nipple inward. Breast cancer is usually painless. So cancer is not exactly the breast cancer. Majority cancers, they are painless. So for the diagnostic testing, biopsy is the best initial test. See, the best initial test we need to remember is biopsy. The different methods of biopsy are we can go for fine needle aspiration. That is usually the best initial biopsy. And the false positive rate is less than 2%. However, because FNAC is a small sample, the disadvantages are false negative rate of 10%. So there may be a chance of false negative rate, but its false positive rate is less than 2%. So it's always a best initial biopsy in case of breast cancer. Then we have core needle biopsy. This is a large sample of the breast. So in fine needle, as the name indicates, fine. So there will be a small sample. But in case of core needle biopsy, there is a larger sample of the breast. It is more deforming, but you can test for estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, and HER2 new receptors and all that. So we can easily think that because of the larger sample, we can evaluate these receptors also. Difficulties include greater deformity with the procedure and the possibility that the needle will miss the lesion. So difficulties, there are some difficulties that include greater deformity with the procedure and the possibility that the needle will miss the lesion. Then we have open biopsy. Open biopsy is considered to be the most accurate diagnostic test. See, the best initial biopsy is FNAC and the most accurate diagnostic test is open biopsy. Open biopsy allows for frozen section to be done while the patient is in the operating room followed by immediate resection of cancer. So if the frozen result is like cancer, then we will definitely go for the resection followed by sentinel node, bi node biopsy. So most accurate diagnostic test is the open biopsy. We'll take the frozen section. If it's positive for the malignancy, then we'll go for the resection and followed by sentinel node biopsy. We'll do the sentinel node biopsy. You cannot test for estrogen or progesterone receptors or HER2 or new on FNAC. Definitely FNAC is fine. It will have small areas involved. So in FNAC, we won't be able to test on receptors. Now mammography. Mammography is indicated to screen for breast cancer in the general population starting at the age of 50. So at the age of 50 in general population we are going to screen our patients with the help of this mammography. A woman finds a hard non-tender breast mass on self-examination. There is no alteration of the mass with menstruation. She is scheduled to undergo a FNA biopsy, FNAC which of the following is most likely to benefit the patient. So she, there is no alteration of the mass with menstruation and this is non-tender hard and uh, hard mass on examination and she is scheduled to undergo FNAC. What, which of the following is most likely to benefit the patient? Either we will ask the patient to go for the mammography or BRCA testing ultrasound bone scan PET scan. So of course in the case of non-tender hard breast mass which is already scheduled for FNAC you can, uh, age is not mentioned but we can go for mammography. This is the most likely to benefit the patient. Why? Because of breast biopsy is going to be performed what is the point in doing a screening test like mammography the answer is 5 to 10 percent of patients have bilateral disease in addition there is a huge difference in the management of the patient if there is a single lesion or multiple lesions within the same breast so definitely on on mammography we will be able to discriminate whether it's a single lesion or some multiple lesion brca testing confirms an extra risk of cancer compared to the general population but that is not we are going to do in this patient uh, as initial uh, diagnostic test so brca testing confirms an extra risk of cancer but will add nothing to a patient who must already undergo biopsy she's already undergoing biopsy right so in, in her case we only go for mammography ultrasound is useful in evaluating whether masses that are equi vocal by clinical examination are cystic or solid so only we are going to discriminate cystic or solid masses on the basis of ultrasound and that's the equi vocal test right bone scan is used after a diagnosis of breast cancer is made to exclude ocular metastasis we can go for the bone scanning right but once we have 
concluded that this is breast cancer then only we can proceed to go on scan not not now pet scan helps determine the content of abnormal masses within the body or enlarged nodes without biopsy however pet scan does not eliminate the need to establish an initial diagnosis with biopsy so of course does not eliminate the need to establish an initial diagnosis with biopsy so this we are not going to do an in initial as initial management mri is used in young women with dense breast so here the most favorable answer which is the, of the following is the most likely to benefit the patient is mammography we want to see whether there is a single lesion multiple lesion and bilateral involvement is there or not now when is ultrasound the answer clinically indeterminate mass lesions it tells cyst versus cyst versus solid lesion so if it's a cystic uh, lesion or so uh, solid lesion that we can easily distinguish on the basis of ultrasound so clinically indeterminate mass lesions will go for the ultrasound and on ultrasound if the lesion is painful and varies in size or pain with menstruation like cystic one right so they are usually their size is usually associated with menstruation so we will um, go for the answer of ultrasound if the patient is complaining of painful mass and with that mass is varies in size or pain with menstruation is associated then we will definitely go for the ultrasound now when is pet scan the answer when we are going for the pet scanning to determine the content of abnormal lymph nodes that are not easily accessible to biopsy so on biopsy we won't be able uh, to get an access easily towards these lymph nodes to determine the content of abnormal lymph nodes we will go for the pet scanning cancer increases uptake on pet scan that is positron emission tomography so cancer if it is if it's there cancer the cancer increases uptake on pet scan for example an 8 year old woman with biopsy proven breast cancer has no nodes with cancer in the axilla she is already biopsy proven right and has no nodes with cancer in the axilla the primary lesion is small and the woman may not need adjuvant chemotherapy chest ct shows an abnormal hyalur lymph node Ch on chest ct there are abnormal hyalur lymph nodes but uh, she has biopsy or she is only biopsy proven breast cancer but no nodes with cancer in the axilla primary lesion is small and women may not need adjuvant therapy so how do you tell the content of an abnormal of an abnormal inaccessible lesion without biopsy then you need to say the answer is pet scanning whenever the content whenever you want to assess the content of abnormal or inaccessible lesion on biopsy you won't be able to access it properly and without biopsy if you want to go for right for the content of abnormal uh, abnormal uh, this um, uh, solid mass you want to know then we'll try this pet scanning if we don't want a biopsy so inaccessible lesion without biopsy we'll always try pet scanning now for this case 8 year old women with biopsy proven cancer in this case pet scan is useful to exclude metastasis and the need for additional chemotherapy as chest ct shows an abnormal hyalur lymph node so there must be a uh, overall metastasis we can we have to rule out or exclude metastasis in our body so we'll go for the pet scanning and pet scanning uh, uh, will exclude a metastasis and the need for additional chemotherapy so at this point women may not need adjuvant therapy but maybe if we will go for the pet scanning we will find more metastasis and metastatic sites then we'll go for the additional chemotherapy now when brc testing the answer brc is definitely associated with increased risk of breast cancer so brc is associated with increased risk of breast cancer particularly within families brc is associated with ovarian cancer and pancreatic cancer so if it's positive it is highly associated with ovarian plus pancreatic cancer point to ponder the precise utility of mri for breast cancer is not yet clear so mri the precise utility is not clear the thing which is not clear they will not ask you an exam for sure what is not clear is what to do when brc is positive brc has not yet been shown to add mortality benefit to usual management however some patients opt for bilateral mastectomy so it's a familial second genital it's for the familial testing we'll go for brca testing now when is sentinel lymph node biopsy the answer when we are going to choose sentinel lymph node biopsy the first node identified near the positive field of definitively identified breast cancer is the sentinel node whatever the node is which is which is near the operative field of a definite definitively identified breast cancer you have identified already that this is breast cancer so whichever the lymph node which is very close or near the operative field will say that this is sentinel node and we have to go for the sentinel node biopsy whenever on frozen section you are going to see it's a malignant lesion 
contrast the dice plays into the operating field and first node identified that it travels to is the sentinel node similarly you, are, you have added this contrast the die material into the operative field and the first node which is going to identify on the basis of this contrast or die material you will say this is sentinel node Sentinel node biopsy is done routinely in all patients at the time of lumpectomy or mastectomy. Whether you're going for the lumpectomy or you're going for the mastectomy, for all these patients, we have to go for sentinel node biopsy and it's done routinely in all patients. A negative sentinel node eliminates the need for axillary lymph node dissection. Of course, if it's negative, then it means that we are not going to go for dissection of this axillary lymph node. When are estrogen and progesterone receptors tested? When you are going, when you are going to uh, do the test of these receptors, these estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors. So, estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor testing is routine for all patients. It's a routine testing. Hormone manipulation therapy is done if either test is positive. So, only if the test is positive, whether the estrogen or progesterone, then we'll go for hormone manipulation therapy. Now, tip for us is with so many methods to low mortality in breast cancer, USMLE step 2 CK will not engage in the speculation about who should get BRC testing. It's just not clear. So the thing which is not clear, they are not going to ask an exam. Now for the treatment option of breast cancer surgery, lumpectomy with radiation is equal in efficacy to modified radical mastectomy but much less deforming. So it's of course, it's lump lumpectomy, it's much less deforming. But lumpectomy with radiation is equal in efficacy to modified whether you are going to go for this modified radical mastectomy or you'll go for the lumpectomy with radiation both are equivalent the addition of radiation to lumpectomy is not a small issue radiation at the site of the cancer is indispensable in preventing recurrences at the breast lumpectomy is contraindicated if the cancer is multifocal or radiation is contraindicated so if the radiation is contraindicated if lumpact uh, if um, cancer is multifocal please don't go for lumpectomy now tip for us is radical mastectomy is always the wrong answer we will not go for that we'll go for lumpectomy with radiation most of the time now we're coming towards hormonal manipulation. All estrogen and progesterone positive patients should receive. If the patient is positive, this estrogen positive and PR positive, then you will go for uh, tamoxifen, raloxifen, or one of the aromatase inhibitors, whether this inastrozole, itrozole, or this eczemestane. So these are all aromatase inhibitors. So we'll go for this tamoxifen, raloxifen, we'll go for this aromatase inhibitor. If there is positive ER, that is estrogen progesterone positive receptors, aromatase inhibitors seem to have a slightly superiority in efficacy. If both are among the answer choices, then we'll go for aromatase inhibitors as the answer to the most likely to benefit the patient question. So we'll go for this aromatase inhibitor. This is the most uh, likely to benefit the patient, like inestrozole, like litrozole, exmestane. So these are uh, aromatase inhibitors, and we have to choose these. Aromatase inhibitors are generally for postmenopausal women. Tamoxifen is better in premenopausal patients. So again, we have this point in our hand. If your patient is having an age below 51 years, we'll choose this tamoxifen, right? And if it's 51 and more than 51, definitely we'll go for aromatase inhibitors. Now, 51 is a mean age for menopause. Tamoxifen gives endometrial cancer and clots. Tamoxifen is a selective estrogen modifier. Aromatase inhibitors give osteoporosis. So these are the some of the very important uh, adverse effect of these medication. Like tamoxifen can give, give rise to this endometrial cancer and clots. So and why? Because tamoxifen is a selective estrogen modifier. As compared to aromatase inhibitors, they give osteoporosis because aromatase inhibitors inhibit estrogen effect anywhere, even the good effects like on bone density. So bone density will be decreased. As a result, the patient will suffer from this osteoporosis. So two main side effects, stemoxifen, lead to endometrial cancer and clots, and aromatase inhibitors will give osteoporosis. Now, tip for us is if two treatments are very close in efficacy, how can you be tested on them? You will need to understand the differences in their adverse effect. Then only on the basis of adverse effect, you are going to choose, okay, my patient is already having uh, bone disease or there's already a, a density is less, never go for aromatase inhibitor treatment plan. Why? Because it will be much more aggravation of osteoporosis if we use aromatase inhibitors in those patients already having bony problems. 
then we have this trastuzumab this is cardiotoxic so definitely in cardiac patient we are not going to use this trastuzumab what is this when is trastuzumab the answer when we are going to use this trastuzumab all breast cancer should be tested for her two new receptor this is an abnormal estrogen receptor so we need to check in all patients in all patients who are having breast cancers we need to check this her and two new receptors right these are abnormal estrogen receptors and those who are positive should receive anti her antibodies known as trastuzumab so those who are having this positive abnormal estrogen receptors in those patients we are going to use this trastuzumab trastuzumab decreases the risk of recurrent disease and increase survival so this is the mode this is the actually uh, the main action of this trastuzumab it's going to decrease the risk of recurrent disease and increase survival when is adjuvant chemotherapy the answer when we are going to say we have to use adjuvant chemotherapy adjuvant chemotherapy is not prophylactic is not for the prophylaxis since patients already have the disease it is not treatment since the term implies there are no clearly identified metastases adjuvant means an additional therapy to clean up presumed microscopic cancer cells too small in amount to be detected so if the cancer cells are too small in amount to be detected as an additional therapy to clean up presumed microscopic cancers we will always use this adjuvant chemotherapy so we just make make a clear note of it that adjuvant is actually an additional therapy adjuvant chemotherapy is the answer when lesions are larger than 1 cm and positive axillary lymph nodes are found so if there is positive axillary lymph node in our patient if the patient is having lesion which is more than 1 cm then as an additional therapy will go for this adjuvant chemotherapy a point to ponder use to moxifene when multiple first degree relatives have breast cancer it lowers the risk of breast cancer so if if in family history there are multiple first degree relatives which are already have this breast cancer then in those patients we have to use to moxifene why because it lowers the risk of breast cancer now all of these definitely lower mortality if you are considering only about the mortality so it's always better to screen our patient with this mammography to do this estrogen progesterone receptor testing then we will add accordingly to moxifen and raloxifen aromatase inhibitors we can always start adjuvant chemotherapy we should give lumpectomy radiation it's 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 more uh, better as compared to the modified radical mastectomy and if the patient is having abnormal estrogen receptor positive that is anti her2 new there uh, means Uh, uh, this her and two new receptor then we'll give this anti her two new antibodies that is trastuzumab and prophylaxis with tamoxifen or raloxifen is always a good choice we can always give this as a prophylaxis this tamoxifen so these are these medications definitely lower mortality now we're coming towards prostate cancer prostate cancer presents with obstructive symptoms on voiding similar to benign prostatic hypertrophy or a palpable lesion on examination So just like BPA, just like palpable lesion examination, the patient is having obstructive symptoms on voiding. In case of prostate cancer, also, biopsy is the best initial test and the most accurate test. Most prostate cancers are asymptomatic. So in a case of prostate cancer, we should remember that biopsy is the best initial also and the most accurate one also. So best initial and most accurate both tests are actually uh, are good. Uh, that is biopsy. most prostate cancers are asymptomatic we don't know what to do about brc when it is positive so that's important we don't know what to do about brc when it is positive so if it, if there if it's not clear they're not going to ask you so leave it now for the treatment option prostatectomy may have a slight benefit over radiation in terms of survival so will it's always better to go for prostatectomy because it may have a slight benefit over radiation in terms of survival and the most common complications of prostatectomy are number 2 uh, there are two most common complications of prostatectomy first is erectile dysfunction and second is urinary incontinence they are considered to be the most common complications the point to ponder here is half of men above age 80 have prostate cancer on autopsy so it's 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 like it's very common in men right half of men about age 80 have prostate cancer on autopsy because it is asymptomatic so patient won't be able to present as any symptoms or with symptoms now it is not known whether prostatectomy external beam radiation or implantable radioactive pellets or watchful waiting is superior in localized prostate cancer you will be expected to know that surgery is more likely to give erectile dysfunction compared to radiation that's important like it's if we go for the surgical option it will give 
more problem like erectile dysfunction as compared to radiation radiation if will go for then also leads to diarrhea so this is the this is the adverse effect of radiation it can lead to diarrhea but if you're using if we are using this uh, surgical option then surgery is more likely to give erectile dysfunction that's important point to remember adverse effect questions are always clear because if we want to know that we have two options which option will be the best suited for our patient always check the adverse effect first and on the basis of adverse effect we'll decide yeah this medication is good for my patient or not then we go for glycine grading this glycine grading is a major of the aggressiveness or malignant potential of prostate cancer a high glycine grade suggests a greater benefit of surgical removal of the prostate get it out before it metastasizes if the glycine grade is high see glycine grading is a measure of aggressiveness or malignant potential of prostate cancer so the prostate cancer who is having malignant potential and you want to know the aggressiveness for this prostate cancer then we'll measure this glycine grading a high glycine grade suggests a greater benefit of surgical removal of prostate if the glycine grade is high definitely your patient is going to benefit when you are going to surgically remove the prostate get it out before it metastasizes it's very important because one cancer will metastasize so before metastasis you should remove it if the glycine grade is high now we have this hormonal manipulation in prostate cancer flutamide sorry flutamide this uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist ketoconazole and arcatomy help control the size and progression of metastasis if you want to uh, control the size and progression of metastasis once they have occurred we can go for this orchiectomy we can go for this ketoconazole we can go for this gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist glutamide they are not like tamoxifen in breast cancer they do not prevent recurrences they shrink lesions that are already present so in prostate cancer we are going to use this flutamide and GnRH agonist and ketoconazole and orchiectomy what they are going to do they are not like just tamoxifen they just they do not prevent recurrences they just shrink the lesion that are already present then we have this abiraterone is an inhibitor of 17 hydroxylase that stops production of all androgens in the body including adrenal production of androgens and this medication decreases the progression of metastatic prostate cancer and decreases the risk of death in by 30% so see the medication which we are using here that is 17 hydroxylase inhibitor that is abiraterone this medication is actually stopped the production of androgens in the body so if androgens are are stopped right then what will happen including adrenal, adrenal productions of androgen also then this medication decreases the progression so this is how it's going to stop the metastasis going to stop the progression of the metastatic metastasis so this decreases the progression of metastatic prostate cancer and decreases the risk of death by 30 percent so in simple words we can say this abiturron is actually work by the progression is actually decreases the pro progression of metastatic prostate cancer this abiraterone lowers mortality in metastatic prostate cancer so this is point to ponder management that is definitely not beneficial in prostate cancer see these answers are always wrong we should not choose this like no screening imaging study prostate ultrasound is not a screening test no screening imaging study prostate ultrasound is not a screening test it is used to localize lesions to biopsy when psa is high so we are not going to go for the screening imaging study ultrasound is not for the screening uh, screening purpose we can only go for this screening uh, this ultrasound when the patient is having high prostate specific antigen no lumpectomy we will we are not going to go for the lumpectomy in the in prostate cancer chemotherapy is used only if hormone therapy does not work see these answers are always wrong we should not choose that like chemotherapy is all is used only if hormonal therapy does not work or no hormone manipulation to prevent recurrence so these are all wrong answers now prostate specific antigen is a controversial subject for the following reason there is no clear mortality benefit with prostate specific antigen mortality benefit is not there but psa is not to be routinely offered to the patient we should not offer this pca testing to our patient a normal psa does not exclude the possibility of prostate cancer so what is the point because if the even if the psa is normal the patient must be having a prostate cancer inside so it's not a uh, mortal it's it's they, it has no clear mortality benefit with psa 
above age 75 do not do even if asked if the patient is more than 75 do not do this pca testing even if asked the tip is if the question specifically says the patient is requesting prostate specific antigen to screen for cancer then the answer is do the test if the patient is requesting then only you can go for the testing otherwise no need the higher the psa the greater the risk of cancer psa correspond to the volume of cancer actually so definitely if the psa level is high then the greater the risk of cancer level will be there so see this is a, a algorithm elevated ps algorithm if there is elevated prostate specific antigen we'll go for the palpation of the mass if the mass is palpable we have to biopsy it right but if the mass is not palpable then we'll go for the transrectal ultrasound if on ultrasound we'll see the mass in then biopsy the mass if there is no mass in then multiple blind biopsies we will take multiple blind biopsies so we have to take biopsy whether the mass is visible we can take directly from that or if the mass is not visible then we have to blindly take multiple biopsies now we are coming towards lung cancer the most important question for lung cancer is who should be treated with surgery in which patients we are going to offer surgery the size of the lesion is not the most important factor in whether or not the lesion is resectable if the lesion is large but is surrounded by normal lung and there is enough remaining lung function post resection then surgery is is still possible so see the size of the lesion is not the important factor in whether or not the lesion is resectable size of the lesion is not the most important factor is not the most important factor if the lesion is large but is surrounded by normal lung and there is enough remaining lung function post resection then surgery is still possible so if the lesion is large then we'll go for the surgical option screen for lung cancer annually with low dose chest ct in those with so we can always screen our patient for lung cancers with this low dose chest ct if our patient is, is uh, having a history of 30 pack year smoking history and his age is in between 55 to 80, we'll go for a screening test for lung cancer that is low dose chest CT. Surgery is not possible in these cases. In which cases surgery is not possible? If it's a bilateral disease or lymph nodes involved on opposite side, if the patient is having malignant pleural effusion, if there is heart care and aorta, vena cava is involved. So in all these cases, surgery is not possible. If there is bilateral disease or lymph node involved on the opposite side, if it's a malignant pleural fusion there, if the heart is involved, perina is involved, aorta or vena cava is involved, then definitely will not go for the surgical option. Small cell cancer is considered unresectable in 95% of cases because it is metastatic or spread outside one lung. So if it's spread outside the lung, then it's impossible or it's highly unlikely to go for the uh, this resection so small cell lung cancer is considered unresectable in 95 percent of cases now for the treatment option in the question described lung cancer the te that test positive for the programmed death biomarker that is pd not the specific histology the answer is pembrolizumab and nivolumab so see if the question says lung cancer that test positive for the programmed death biomarker so pd biomarker we have tested and that becomes positive in a case of lung cancer then we can use this pembrolizumab and nivolumab in these patients these pd inhibitors are most effective and better tolerated than platinum therapy for non-small cell lung cancer previously we are using this platinum therapy but now it's no more indicated we can only use this PD inhibitors. PD inhibitors are this pembrolizumab and nivolumab and this PD inhibitors, these programmed death biomarker inhibitors are actually going to inhibit these biomarkers and these biomarkers are uh, if it's positive for the uh, these PD markers then we have to use these medications pembrolizumab and nivolumab especially if it's a case of small cell cancer. Now we're coming towards ovarian cancer. There is no screening test for ovarian cancer. No screening test. We have to look for a woman above the age 50 with increasing abdominal girth but who is still losing weight. BRC is associated with ovarian cancer. BRC is also associated with ovarian cancer. The woman who is having uh, the woman who is having increased abdominal girth but still losing weight and her age is more than 50, we can think of this ovarian cancer. The initial test is an ultrasound or CT scan. So ultrasound or CT both are considered to be initial test. The most accurate diagnostic test is biopsy. So imaging techniques will be the initial one and biopsy will be the most accurate diagnostic test. C125 is not for screening. It is all used only for follow-up of treatment. So for the only follow-up 
will go for the CA125 but it is not considered to be a screening test. Now for the treatment option ovarian cancer is the only cancer in which removing large amounts of locally metastatic disease will benefit the patient. So in ovarian cancer we usually remove the large amounts of locally metastatic disease will benefit the patient. Remove all visible tumor and pelvic organs and give chemotherapy. You have to remove all the visible tumor and pelvic organs and then we put our patient on chemotherapy. Now we are coming towards mediastinal masses. Mediastinal masses, we have anterior mediastinal mass, we have posterior mediastinal mass. So anterior we have teratoma, thymoma and thyroid and lymphoma. In posterior we have neurofibromas and esophageal cancer. Then we have this mesothelioma. Mesothelioma is cancer of the covering of the lungs. So see mesothelium, that's the covering of the lungs. So mesothelioma is the cancer of the covering of the lungs. So peritoneum or pericardium. Most 80% are associated with asbestos exposure. However, when the question asks what cancer is most often associated with asbestos, the answer is lung cancer. Lung cancer is highly associated with this asbestosis. The answer is lung cancer because lung cancer is so much more common than mesothelioma. So it's not like that in 80% of cases mesothelioma is because of asbestos. But if the question is saying what cancer is most often associated with asbestos, then we'll answer lung cancer. But in mesothelioma, 80% of cases are just because of this asbestos exposure. Patient with mesothelioma typically present with the symptoms of pleural inflammation infusion such as chest pain, dyspnea, difficulty in breathing and cough. So these are the symptoms of pleural inflammation and effusion. Chest pain, difficulty in breathing, coughing. Now what we are going for, we go for the best initial testing. We have chest x-ray. Chest x-ray is better as compared to chest CT because initial they are asking, right? So we will not go, will not go for the CT directly as initial one. We will start with the chest x-ray, then we will proceed to chest CT, right? Then if they are asking most accurate test, then for most accurate test, we have this pleural or peritoneal biopsy. So biopsy will be considered as a most accurate test, but for the best initial testing, we will start for the, from the x-ray, but we will proceed to chest CT. For the management point of view, surgical removal of the cancerous tissue and in some both radiation chemotherapy. So first started with the surgical removal, then go for radiation and chemotherapy. Now this pleurodesis is a procedure to seal shut the pleural space in those with recurring large pleural fusion. In pleurodesis, the pleura is purposely inflamed with minocycline, bleomycin or tal to obliterate the pleural space. So in pleurodesis, we actually intentionally what we are going to do, we inflamed the, this pleura with the help of this minocycline or bleomycin or tal to obliterate the pleural space. And then it's a procedure to seal shut the pleural space in those with recurring large pleural fusion. So those who are having recurring large pleural fusion, only in those cases we are going to seal and or shut the pleural space. That is known as pleurodesis. Now we're coming towards testicular cancer. Testicular cancer presents with a painless lump in the scrotum that does not trans eliminate increase with history of cryptocardism. So there is a history of cryptocardism and the patient is having a painless lump in the scrotum that does not trans eliminate. So it's a painless lump that does not trans eliminate because it is testicular cancer. So cryptocard means cancer. For the diagnostic testing, remove the whole testicle with inguinal orchiectomy. So you, you have to remove it and then you go for the inguinal orchiectomy. Do not cut the scrotum which can spur spread the disease. Needle biopsy of the testicle is always the wrong answer. We will not, we'll not go for the needle biopsy. Alpha fetoprotein is secreted only by the non seminatus cancer. SCG is up in all of them. So SCG will be raised, right? And alpha fetoprotein is secreted only by non seminatus cancer. So if it's a non seminatus cancer then only you are going to see increased level of alpha fetoprotein if you go for the beta SCG beta SCG is up in all of them staging is performed with CT scan of the abdomen pelvis and chest testicular cancer metastasizes up through the lymphatic channels in the retroperitoneum and moves up into the chest so staging is performed with CT scan of the abdomen so we'll go for this staging with the help of uh, staging we'll perform with CT scan uh, CT scan of abdomen, CT scan of pelvis, chest, testicular cancer metastasis up through the lymphatic channels in the retroperitoneum and moves up into the chest. So if, it's, if there is testicular cancer that metastasizes up through the lymphatic channels where into the retroperitoneum and then it will move up into the chest. Seminoma, 
see it's clearly mentioned seminoma sensitive to chemotherapy and radiation this is the most common question they usually ask on exam this seminoma sensitive to what sensitive to chemotherapy and radiation but non seminoma sensitive to only chemotherapy they are not sensitive to radiation so seminoma with both chemotherapy and radiation non seminoma only with chemotherapy they are sensitive now for the treatment option of tracheotomy radiation is used for local disease and chemotherapy is used for wide spread disease this refers to seminoma so we will go for the tracheotomy first then we'll go for the radiation if it's a local disease and if it's a wide spread disease then we'll go for the chemotherapy option and this refers to seminoma only really. now testicular cancer is one of the only malignancies in which chemotherapy can cure widely metastatic disease including spreading to the brain See, testicular cancer is one of the only malignancies in which chemotherapy can cure widely. Even if there is metastasis or spread into the brain, we can also use chemotherapy because chemotherapy can cure widely metastatic disease. All right, now we're coming towards cervical cancer. Very important topic for exam point of view. The management of advanced cervical cancer is clear. We have to perform a hysterectomy. So management is very simple. We need to remove the uterus. Now, prevention of cervical cancer. This is very important. The so, HPV vaccine is now approved for all men and women between ages 11 to 45. This HPV vaccine is now indicated in between these ages, 11 to 45. Pap smear is performed starting at age 21. Repeat the test every three years until the age of 65. So, 21 to 65. If you are only going to go for the Pap smear, repeat Pap smear after every three years. Of women with fetal cervical cancer, 85% have never had a pap smear. Then pap and HPV testing increase the interval to 5 years. So if you are going for two tests like pap and HPV testing, then test, test increase the interval to 5 years. Don't go for every 3 years. Then we will go for every 5 years. In women aged 30 to 65, HPV testing alone is also acceptable. But it's always better to go for the pap smear plus HPV together. And the gap will be of 5-5 five, five years, right? And the age will be 30 to 65. But for the pap smear, age is 21 to 65. And every 3 years, you have to go for pap smear testing. Now we're coming towards detection of cervical cancer. Low grade and high grade displays on pap smear are followed up with colposcopy for a biopsy. You see, if, if on the pap smear report, you have seen this low grade and high grade dysplasia. So if this low grade and high grade dysplasia, we will do pap smear are followed up with colposcopy. And next time, you will do colposcopy for a biopsy. Atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance, that is ASCUS. If ASCUS is positive, then ASCUS can be a sign of early pre-invasive cancer or infection or may simply be a false positive test. So if there is ASCUS, then we can say it may be a pre-invasive cancer. If ASCUS is present, then you have to perform HPV testing. If HPV is found, then colposcopy is performed. So if, the, if you only go for the pap smear testing, not for the HPV testing, on pap smear you will find this ASCUS and you certainly go for the colposcopy. If HPV is not associated with ASCUS, repeat the pap smear at 6 months. If there is nothing on, H, uh, on pap smear, right, there is no ASCUS. So if HPV is not associated with ASCUS, see if HPV is found, we we'll go for the colposcopy is performed, right. It's important, like if ASCUS is present, we have to perform HPV testing, right? If HPV is found, then we'll go for the colposcopy. But if HPV is not associated with ASCUS, then we will repeat the pap smear after 6 months. That's an important point. Pap smear does not show mortality as much as mammography or colonoscopy. So we'll always go for the pap smear because it will definitely does not lower mortality as much as mammography or colposcopy. Colonoscopy, sorry, not colposcopy. Pap smear does not lower mortality as much as mammography and colonoscopy, but we usually go for the initial testing. It's starting of the age with 21 to 65 for the screening of cervical cancers every after three years if only and if combined with HPV then every after five years. Now we're coming towards chemotherapy induced nausea. Through the three main classes of medication used to treat chemotherapy induced nausea and five hydroxytryptamine inhibitors, neurokinin 1, NK receptors antagonists and glucocorticoid. All three type of drugs can be combined in severe nausea and vomiting from chemotherapy. So 
chemotherapy is always associated with nausea and vomiting. So in order to prevent this nausea and vomiting when the patient is using chemotherapy, we'll prescribe this 5-hydroxytryptamine inhibitor, we'll prescribe this ancolisaprine tonkinates and gluco glucocorticoid. These are the medication which we are going to use to treat chemotherapy induced nausea, right? 5-HT inhibitors, they are like onset, on desteron, grensteron, or this uh, pelonesteron and dolesteron. 5-HT inhibitors are the answer to the best initial therapy question. Onset, this on the strong, the best initial one, but do not give 5 HT inhibitor with QT prolongation on EKG. But if there are EKG changes, EKG findings, like there is QT prolongation, then you should not use onset. This exception is a good exam question. We should know that if in the case of EKG QT prolongation, we will not use 5 HT inhibitors that is onset on the strong most likely. Glucocorticoids, dexamethasone is used first. Steroids have major anti nausea effect. Combination with the steroid is effective only with 5 this HT inhibitor. So we'll go for the dexamethasone. It's used first, and we should know that steroids have major anti nausea effect. So chemotherapy induced nausea will correct it with the help of this glucocorticoid also. NQ receptors antagonist. Ap this uh, apripent, uh, this uh, apripitent or rolapitent or this uh, neutropitent, these are all NK receptors and NK receptor antagonists are the answer. If F5 HT inhibitors do not work, starting with the 5 HT inhibitor, if your patient is not responding or cannot be given because of QT prolongation on EKG, then we can use as an alternative that is NK receptor antagonist. The phenothiazines, this prochlorperazine and chlorpyrimazine are antimatics that are less effective than 5 ht and NK antagonists. We can use them, but they're very less effective. Unless we won't be able to use 5 ht and NK antagonists, we will then we'll go for phenothiazines and prochlorperazine or chlorpyrimazine. But it's always necessary to start this 5 ht as a first thing. There will be the wrong answer choice in question about chemotherapy induced nausea. For the chemotherapy induced nausea, we'll not go for this phenothiazine or prochlorperazine or chlorpyrimazine. If it's chemotherapy induced nausea, we'll go for 5 ht, we'll go for NK antagonist. Metoclopramide is useful for the nausea of diabetic gastroparesis and these medications have no utility in combination because they are all dopamine receptor antagonists. See, metoclopramide and this all phenothiazine and all that, they are all dopamine receptor antagonists, right? These medications have no utility in combination because they are all dopamine. But if you want to control the chemotherapy-induced nausea, we only have two options best in our hand. One is 5-HT and second one is NK antagonist. All right, so this is end of oncology session. So tomorrow, inshallah, we are going to start with this preventive medicine. Thank you so much. Good day. Bye.